Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Fabulous Concert Programs number 57, and the fifth and last of our programs dedicated to less familiar Sibelius works. And today, we're going to be programming Symphony Number no. 3, probably the least popular of all the Sibelius symphonies, and I can't for the life of me understand why. It's so listener-friendly. It's in three concise movements. It lasts almost exactly like half an hour, give or take a minute. It, 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 the tunes are wonderful. They're easy to follow. The ending is refreshing and lively and it's not triumphant, but just satisfying. I mean, it's C major satisfying. It's a parade festooned with floats and stuff. And it, it, it's just, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. One of the reasons I think it doesn't get played so much is that it's actually quite difficult to perform. It really is. I know. We tried to do it in one of my community orchestras, and the strings almost had a nervous breakdown. It's really, really a tough piece to do well. It requires a great deal of rehearsal, and it has a lot of tricky spots. So that's one issue. Um, the other issue is that I think some people find it just too lightweight to make you know, a grand statement. It does make a statement. It's not a grandiose statement. Sibelius, when he got to the third, had turned his back on the romantic, grandiose school. He really had, except for maybe kind of at the end of the fifth, where he recaptured a little bit of it. But in the next few symphonies, his, his intention was to create a sort of organic, kind of, you know, inevitable neoclassical thing. And he was doing it much earlier than anybody else. I mean, than Stravinsky or any of those people. I mean, this is, we're talking the first few years of the 20th century when he wrote this symphony. It was about, what, 1905, 1907, somewhere in there. And, the, you know, the only other piece that was as sort of as neoclassical was actually Mahler's Fourth, which was neoclassical in an entirely different way. But they did have that in common, this recapturing of of proportion and and coherence and and shape and it's it's just a beautiful beautiful work it really is so it deserves to get played and people would like it i mean i remember very vividly once i was invited uh, on an absolutely horrible trip to the hamptons back when i was working in real estate banking and and someone had a house there and the house was you know on the shore of the, the hamptons possibly the most overrated part of the country in the universe and the most overpriced. So yes, he had a house. It did go down to the beach. The beach was nothing but rocks, razor sharp rocks. And, you know, you had to go like buy food to cook and the town was packed and there was nothing with all the, you know, and aside from the fact that all the people you hate who live in Manhattan are there on the weekend. So it's really much better to stay in Manhattan where all the horrible people have gone somewhere else. I thought, you know, I mean, I couldn't figure it. So I, I went. And as usual with these things, I brought a few CDs along in case I had an opportunity to listen to something. We got to talking and they, you know, they knew that I was doing music stuff and they asked me to play something. So I popped on Sibelius's Third Symphony. It was the Alexander Gibson performance. Well, it just made a sensation. Everybody loved it. I had to play it over and over the whole weekend. It like almost compensated for the fact that I was there in the Hamptons. And so that was really the nicest thing about the weekend. So I mean, it just goes to show. And these were not classical music people. These were normal people. Well, they were normal people who like going to the Hamptons. So that's a whole other issue. Anyway, it's a great piece. But how do we program it? What do we do to give it some sort of context and where it stands out and provides the capstone of a beautiful program, but isn't overwhelmed by more obvious repertoire? That was the catch. So I've come up with four pieces, two symphonies and two suites, which I think is kind of like a fun little thing. The two symphonies encapsulating two suites. So there's a lighter element to it. It's a substantial program in terms of length, but a very rewarding one in terms of, in terms of content. We begin in the first half with Haydn's Symphony Number no. 13. No one ever plays the 13th. It's a wonderful work. It's the one that ends with a contrapuntal finale based on the same tune as Mozart's Jupiter Symphony. You know, ba, ba, da, da, that one. That's in there. And it also is scored for four horns plus timpani, which was very unusual for early Haydn symphonies. So it's a small piece. It's like 15 minutes long, but it has a certain bigness of sound. 
and it, it, it gives you a substantial nugget, a lovely appetizer, before leading to suite number one. Now, the first suite is the block suite for viola and orchestra, which is one of the incomparably great pieces for viola and orchestra of the 20th century. It's gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous, and it has this wonderfully colorful perky Chinese style finale with crackling percussion, but the overall mood of the work, it remains rather happy and a little bit on the lighter side. It's not a heavy duty symphonic and it's for viola. So the viola provides this sort of dusky, husky, you know, meat and potatoes timbre, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to be like tragic and dark and sinister. I mean, it's none of those things. It's just beautiful. And it's in cyclical form and it's wonderfully put together. So that's a wonderful piece to end the first part. It's unusual. You'll have a viola soloist, which you almost never have unless you're doing like the Mozart Sinfonia Concertant or the Walton Viola Concerto. I mean, there's there are a lot of viola concertos. Some of them are very good, but they almost never get performed because no one cares. And, and it's a viola, you know what I mean? But this piece is a viola piece that'll really create a wonderful impression as you toodle out for intermission. Now on the way back, we have a suite and a symphony. The symphony that concludes the program is Sibelius's third. The suite is Dvorak's Czech suite, another delicious work for a chamber-sized orchestra that never gets played. It's just, just full of gorgeous, gorgeous tunes, marvelous tunes, especially the romance, which has like an English horn solo that's to die for, and which sounds remarkably Sibelian, actually. It's kind of fascinating that way. Um, it's, it, I, I just think it should be played. And it's like 20 minutes long in five perky movements. You're in great shape. It's light and breezy and refreshing. And so is the Sibelius. So then you conclude with the Sibelius third, which is also light and breezy and refreshing, but it has more weight. It has more substance. It has that amen ending to the first movement, the twilight slow movement, and oh my goodness, that fun scherzo slash finale mixture that brings the whole thing home. I mean, it's a hard movement to time and a lot of performances blow it. It has to have the right sense of momentum that carries right through the final bars and the timpani part, which is marked diminuendo, has to do it. You can't keep it rolling fortissimo. It's not what this symphony is. It should end with a glow, not with a bang. And so if you do it that way, if you, you put this whole program together, you're going to have an absolutely splendid, unusual program that will highlight Sibelius's third without overwhelming it, which was the whole point. That's the trick. So give it a listen at home. You'll never hear it live. See what you think and keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.